Uh, on behalf of the APS Fund for Teaching and the Public Understanding of Psychological Science, I have the great pleasure of introducing this year's distinguished APS David Myers Lecturer on Teaching, Daniel Willingham. Daniel Willingham received his PhD from Harvard University. He now teaches at the University of Virginia, where he has been the recipient of numerous teaching awards. His prolific scholarship has addressed memory and learning using multidisciplinary methods, and he has excelled at giving psychological science away to the great benefit of primary, secondary, and higher education. If, as he has written, quote, thinking is the hardest work there is, unquote, there are few in our field who have worked harder than Daniel Willingham to contribute thoughtfully to the social good. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Willingham. Thanks very much for that kind introduction, Neil. Thank you all very much for uh, spending a little bit of time with me this afternoon. Um, as you can see, my topic is about using psychological science in K-12 education. Uh, and, and also, as you can see, it's about improving the use of psychological science in K-12 education, because certainly attempts are being made to use it. Uh, but I'm going to suggest we're not doing as good a job as we can. So here's the basic outline of the talk, four main points uh, that I want to hit. Uh, as you can see, I posed the question, how can K-12 educators use psychological science? And there's the answer for you. There's the spoiler. It's, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about developing in teachers a useful mental model of the learner, uh, understanding how kids think. Uh, but I'll go on to suggest that, first of all, we're, we're already trying to do that, but we have a problem in doing it. We're not as successful as we ought to be. Uh, and then I will propose a solution, more careful attention uh, as to what ought to go into the model. Uh, and then finally, this is sort of the, the bumper sticker version of uh, my assessment of what the, what the issue is, why we're less successful than we ought to be. What we're doing is we're training future practitioners as though they are future researchers. So I will elaborate on that as we go. Uh, but let's start here. Uh, with the, uh, thinking through how uh, K-12 educators can use psychological science. So here's basic science. Here's the stuff that most of us at this conference are doing, trying to understand how people think. There are two main methods by which we can use information from the basic sciences to inform education. One is things that we learn about how children think can be used to inspire new materials and practices. So a classic example of this would be Skinnerian behaviorism, which has influenced classrooms and continues to influence classrooms in its conception of the role of rewards and occasionally punishments in classrooms. So many teachers think about behaviorist principles as they think about, especially in early elementary, as they're thinking about how to get kids to uh, conform to the rules of the classroom. So we can get inspiration for new practices in teaching. The second method is where we use methods from basic science to evaluate classroom practices. So for example, if you're not familiar with it, Accelerated Reader is a program that's usually used school-wide that's meant to uh, improve motivation for reading, increase children's motivation to read. Uh, more of you might be familiar with Pizza Hut's Book It program if you're of a certain age and, and are an American kid that was deeply embedded in many, many schools. That was a program by which if you uh, read a certain number of books, you got a free personal pan pizza. Now, neither of these were inspired by basic science. They were inspired by, well, it's pretty obvious what they were inspired by, but you could evaluate the extent to which they work. So we've got methods in science that are better than casual observation to evaluate whether accelerated reader improves motivation as it claims compared to uh, business as usual in classrooms, and then we can compare it to Pizza Hut, Book It, and so forth. Okay, so those are the two main methods. We can think about new practices, or we can take practices that were inspired in some way other than basic science, and we can use methods of science to evaluate their effectiveness. What I'm really concerned about is a third method, a uh, third way that basic science can uh, help with education, uh, and it's uh, uh, illustrated here. So this was a, a conversation I had with a teacher 
a couple years ago now, it was October, she was a brand new teacher. I said, how's it going? You know, you had a month in the classroom. And she said, well, no one told me in any of my education classes how to deal with a spinner. Like they didn't tell me what you know that I was I should anticipate having a spinner. And whenever I give this talk with teachers, everyone's like, "Oh, a spinner." If you're not familiar with what a spinner is, a spinner is in this case it was a, a, a young girl in second grade who, at unpredictable times, gets up out of her seat and goes in a corner and starts spinning. Right? This is an illustration of a very general problem that teachers have, which is we try and uh, give them uh, training and experiences that will prepare them for classrooms, but classrooms are unpredictable. They are going to encounter problems that, they, that no one told them they were going to encounter. So what do they do at those moments that they, uh, they, they have this novel problem? Well, this is where basic science can actually help. Uh, because what they're going to do at that moment is going to be at least partially informed by what I'm going to call a mental model of a learner. So these are beliefs about cognition and emotion and motivation in children. It's basically what they, what they think kids are like. They're going to uh, rely on that at least in part. Um, they, we, we do have some empirical evidence about uh, what sort of mental models uh, teachers do have. It won't surprise you to learn that we know that teachers, before they begin their training uh, for, for classrooms, they already come into their training with beliefs about what kids are like. Um, and that those beliefs are affected by the training that they experience, and they're also affected by classroom experiences. So our goal here is really that educators will have a more informed mental model of how children learn. This is we think that we as basic scientists have something to offer here. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the main setup, the, the main problem that I'm interested in. And now let me tell you why I think we might have a problem. So what I'm suggesting is the mental model of the learner that most teachers have could be better, or it could be better informed by science. How do we know that? Well, the truth is we don't know, we know less about this than you would think we do. One thing we'd like to know is what are teachers, future teachers taught about how children learn? What are they taught about kids' emotion and, and motivation lives? Well, the answer is it's very, very hard to generalize. There are thousands of programs that train future teachers and they vary a great deal. Right? As, as you would expect, if you're training to be a high school social studies teacher, you're going to undergo a different program of training than if you aim to be an early elementary reading uh, specialist, for example. Um, and also, there are different state requirements. That said, there is some consistency. And one of the consistency that people have pointed out is almost all of the programs do require some exposure to this content. It's either in an educational psychology class or a foundations of education course. So even though we don't have great data on this, most people think most teachers probably are exposed to this content. More persuasive, I think, is looking at licensing exams. So thinking about exams that teachers have to pass in order to be licensed as a public school teacher in various states. Each state has uh, different licensing requirements. Uh, but many of them use a test called the Praxis II, which is written by Educational Testing Service. It's used by about 35 states. Um, and if you look at the, the uh, guidelines that are published by Educational Testing Service for how to study for the Praxis, it includes information that we might expect. Uh, it's include regarding what people are supposed to know about educational psychology. Okay, so this is a pretty good reason to think that teachers are probably exposed to this, and at some point, uh, they, they actually need to learn it. Now, that doesn't mean that practicing teachers actually remember it. And again, our data here are not as robust as we would like them to be. But when we have studies of what teachers know about how kids learn, the results are often disappointing. So this is a recent study from 2017. This was a large survey that had uh, respondents evaluate lots of different statements. What you're seeing here is a small subset of statements. These were plucked out in particular because they are commonly referred to as neuromyths. They are uh, common beliefs that the public holds about how people learn that are false. Right? And so what you're seeing, so things like that, uh, uh, 
people, different people learn according to uh, different learning styles, that dyslexia, um, the problem there is that children are seeing letters backwards, the Mozart effect, and so forth. And you can see the columns. I'm sure you've already been looking at it. These are percentage of people endorsing these statements as true. And you can see educators are generally doing better than the public, but we were, they're not really where we would like them to be, right? They, they, these, all these figures should be very close to zero. So that's, that's a little bit disheartening. Another really informative source of data on teacher training comes from the American Federation Teacher, uh, excuse me, American Federation of Teachers survey from 2012. So the AFT is one of the two big teachers unions. They represent about a million teachers nationwide. Um, and so they did a very high quality uh, nationally representative survey of their membership. And they asked them about their opinion of their education. And in general, they were pretty lukewarm. They said it was not very influential to my practice. The number one influence on their practice, according to this survey, is their own experience. Second most important um, influence on their practice is the experience of other teachers that they know and respect. And then quite low down on the list is their training. Their big complaints, in addition to it sort of not being very useful, which is certain, certainly in accordance with, it, with what they're saying, that no, I, that I, don't, I don't use it very often, too theoretical. They say it's interesting. So to the extent they like it, they're like, it's sort of an intellectual exercise. Uh, and it's kind of fun and interesting to hear about, but it's not really of, of very high utility. So putting all that together, what it sounds like is there's an expectation that future teachers are going to learn this content. It's in licensing exams. They must learn it to some extent in order to pass the licensing exam. But then if you look at practicing the teachers, they're not pointing to that as anything there they find very useful in their practice. And indeed, it seems like, based on the data we have, they've forgotten a lot of it. And other sources have come to be influential in how they think about uh, children's learning. OK. Let's talk about a possible solution and what I'm going to propose be done about this. The question, of course, is what ought to go into a mental model of the learner? I'm not the first person to consider this, this question. Very frequently, the way people start with this is inside the head of the teacher and thinking about what would you want teachers to know when they're in a classroom. I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle, which is thinking about it from the perspective of a basic scientist. What do the type of people who are attending APS have to offer future teachers? And in particular, I'm thinking about the types of statements that scientists make. And I'm going to suggest there are three different types of statements, and they vary in the extent to which they are useful to teachers. So that's what I'm focused on. Let's first look at these three different types of statements. What do I what do I mean by this? Well, this is old stuff, again, for everybody in this room. One of the types of statements that we make are observations of the world, right? both uh, from, from the laboratory and uh, outside of the laboratory. One of the things that scientists do is make observations of the world. The second type of statements that scientists make are theoretical statements, brief bundles of statements that are meant to account for and integrate and perhaps explain a much larger set of the observation statements. And then finally, we're interested in epistemic assumptions. We can't develop theories in the absence of making some assumptions about the uh, constructs that we set out to explain. So again, returning back to the very first slide, the, the big picture of what I'm suggesting is that if you're a researcher you uh, and a, a training researcher, a, a researcher who's uh, someone who's learning to be a researcher, you need to be interested in all of these. But what I'm going to suggest is practitioners really should be interested mostly in observations. Right? And that that is a key reason why um, Teachers report that their training is interesting, but too theoretical and not really very practical. OK, so let me go through these one by one to elaborate a little bit on why I think some of them are more useful than others. When I say observations, we can't expect that teachers are going to just learn observations. If we take observations to be, for example, a conclusion from a journal article, um, or observations as reported in a journal article. There are, I don't even know, tens of thousands of journal articles that could be considered relevant to educational psychology published every year. Uh, so instead, I'm going to suggest what would really be useful to teachers are what I will call empirical generalizations. 
Empirical generalizations are observations that have not just have been replicated, but have been shown to be highly regular across different contexts, across ages, across materials, and so forth. And to me, this is giving teachers information about what kids are generally like, how kids behave, how kids think, what their emotional lives are like, and so forth. So here are some examples um, of empirical generalization, candidate empirical generalizations. Learning practice is crucial to gaining expertise. Probing memory improves retention. Memory for specific episodes can be conflated. Memory of generic episodes and so forth. And again, so this, this is just examples to give you a, uh, uh, some sense of what I mean by empirical generalizations of learning. When I uh, last gave this talk to a big group of teachers, everyone started getting out their cameras and taking pictures of them. I'm like, stop. This is not meant to be really important. I basically made these up off the top of my head. But again, it's, it's to, uh, uh, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Now, it's not just, that's, that's not quite enough. I mean, we can imagine this list is going to get quite long. Um, we can constrain it a little bit. One thing we would imagine is that all empirical generalizations are not going to be useful. They ought to hold the promise of some classroom application. So for example, a, uh, a perfectly valid empirical generalization would be that subjects can identify a relatively large number of stimuli after brief, brief exposure, but forgetting of this information is very rapid. I don't know what you would do with this in a classroom. I can't, I can't imagine any utility to it. The other thing is that you would like to see is some consequential effect size. So for example, mood-dependent memory seems to be fairly reliable. Uh, but, uh, and again, you could also question whether that's going to really work out very well in a classroom. You know, sort of saying like, well, Bob, you were happy, as I recall, but when you learned this. So like, here's 10 bucks or something. Like, try and make you happy again so you go, you'll, you'll remember it. Um, but again, it, it, uh, we're worried not just about utility, but also about effect size. OK. so. Observations seem like, uh, I'm suggesting, a good bet for something that teachers would be interested in. Now, theory, you would think that theory would also be quite useful to teachers. Because think about, I mean, again, think about how long this list is going to get. And it sounds like I'm suggesting that what we want to do is ask teachers to learn this incredibly long list of empirical generalization findings. And that one empirical generalization is a list like that would be a terrible way to learn that sort of content. And so instead of, here's some uh, empirical generalizations of working memory, instead of asking them to learn this and a bunch of others, why don't you just ask them to learn a theory of working memory? All right, so here, here's uh, Badly 2012, why don't you just ask them to learn this? There are a couple of problems with asking teachers to learn theories. One thing I'll point out is that theories tend to be abstract and they tend to be difficult to understand. Right, so exa getting exactly at the heart of what teachers complained about, um, something like the visuospatial sketch pattern, the phonological loop, you can sort of explain in terms of memory. Once you get to the episodic buffer and you start dealing with amodal representations, you get into stuff that if you're not used to thinking about mental representations, that's pretty hard first time around, right? Now, that's not necessarily a deal breaker. If you feel like it's really going to be useful for teachers to learn, then you know, everybody should invest the time and they should learn it. There's another problem, though, which is that theories routinely go beyond the data. All right, so here's Badley and Hitch, 74. If you were trying to teach teachers about working memory in the 70s, this is the model you would have shown them. And of course, one prediction of this model is that the visuospatial sketch pad can influence information in the phonological loop unless that influence is coordinated by the central executive. That, whether or not that was true was not known when the model was, uh, uh, was first created. It was a prediction of the model. It turned out to be a prediction that was wrong. Right? So this is a characteristic of teacher training today. Let's go back to the Praxis II, that licensing exam. Here's another requirement of what you're, from the study guide of what teachers are supposed to learn. So you're supposed to know about the contributions of Bandura, Bruner, Dewey, Piaget, and so, Vygotsky, and so forth. So many of these theories are decades old. Right? And almost all of them are known to have real limitations and real problems. So if you look at a textbook of educational psychology, what you'll see is a few pages that describe Piaget's theory, and then several pages after that describing all the ways in which we've had to modify our understanding. Okay, so the 
again, the utility to teachers of learning Piaget and then learning all the ways in which we now understand that Piaget didn't quite have it right, it's hard for me to see why that would be an especially valuable experience for teachers. So I think theories are a bad bet. What about epistemic assumptions? The epistemic assumptions that um, teachers are typically exposed to are sort of the bedrock uh, uh, in psychology. They're exposed to behaviorism, they're exposed to information processing, they're exposed to the situated uh, perspective. That's fine as far as it goes, but I think they overestimate the, um, uh, the extent to which these different perspectives really constrain theory. We know that epistemic assumptions really place quite loose constraints on theory and that within behaviorism, you've got a, a large variety of theories. The same is true of information processing. The same is true of the situated perspective. The danger is that epistemic assumptions are easily confused with empirical generalizations. So one of the things, when I, again, when I'm giving this talk to teachers, I'll frequently ask them how many of you have heard the statement, learning is social. Almost all of them say, yes, of course, we've heard that. And what I point out to them is this is an extremely weak statement. It doesn't, on its own, it doesn't really mean very much. It's an epistemic assumption. All it's really, it's, it's an assumption about the nature of learning. And all it's really saying is, if you develop a theory that completely ignores social factors, your theory is in some way going to be limited. Right? But there are lots of ways that you could generate a theory and see this play out then theories would look quite different. So you could take, in other words, you could take learning as social to mean quite different things. So one thing you could take it to mean is social situations affect learning opportunities. So in other words, um, a child sitting in a classroom is gonna be influenced by his or her peers. Kids sitting next to them might ask different questions. They might be more on task or less on task, so forth. And that's the, the, in that sense, learning is social. It's essentially a source of different types of input. Or you could say uh, learning is social in that all knowledge is socially constructed. So that the way I see the world is influenced by my social history and the peers that I've had around me and my family experiences. So now we're looking not just at, we're not just looking at so learning being social as a, a a question of input, we're looking at it as a, um, a source of input that has shaped the way that you see the world over long periods of time. Or we could say, no, that doesn't, that doesn't really capture what we're talking, what we mean by learning as social at all. Instead, we could think about learning as, it's too limiting to think about learning as being within the head of an individual. So for example, I might think to myself, what do I know about kayaking? Well, the truth is I know very little about kayaking, but I know David Daniel. And David Daniel, I know, knows quite a bit about kayaking. So by virtue of my relationship with David, don't I, in some sense, know much more about kayaking than is just in my head, right? And that's what I mean by learning is social. Right? So statements like this are really quite weak, but they're easily confused with empirical generalization. So learning is social sounds like you're saying children learn best in social situations. Children learn best in social situations is actually an empirical generalization, right? A candidate for that. Not necessarily true, I would, I would argue. Um, but it, that uh, it's, again, easily confused with, uh, with an epistemic assumption. Likewise, learning is situational. Another very common um, uh, epistemic assumption that you hear in educational context that sounds like an empirical generalization. So I argue epistemic assumptions are a bad candidate for uh, teachers to spend much time with. So that's what I think should go into the model, is empirical observations, empirical generalizations. But let's talk now about theories again. We need to circle back. So I rejected theories, because I said theories, you know, the biggest problem for me is that theories make, make novel predictions, and uh, theories always have a shelf life, um, and so they're not practical for, for teachers to learn. What I want to do now is explore in a little more detail differences in the usefulness, of, or sorry, the ways that researchers would use theories and the way that practitioners would use theories. Because we have to get over this problem of asking teachers to learn a long, long list of empirical generalizations. That's not gonna work. So 
characteristics of ways in which researchers and practitioners put theories to different use. Researchers want a theory that does a better job of existing than existing theories of accounting for data and that generates new predictions. That is not useful to a practitioner. What a practitioner needs is a theory that integrates existing empirical generalizations, thereby making them understandable and memorable. They need a way of packaging all of these statements about learning so that they're all integrated and they all make sense. And indeed, you might be able to generate uh, predictions about spinners, right? Uh, novel situations. You're like, I have a general idea about how children learn uh, and that is gonna allow me to act in this, uh, in this new situation. Here are some of the issues that I think are especially important regarding the different ways that researchers and practitioners use theories. One is that researchers expect we're gonna have competing theories. This is the one of the ways that we make advances. We've got several competing theories going. They're making different predictions. We pit one theory against the other. And indeed, if you look at educational psychology textbooks, they have this characteristic. They show different competing theories. These are the most common theories of intelligence that you'll see in educational psychology textbooks. Uh, Bob Sternberg's triarchic theory, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences theory, and then some sort of not very specific, it's, it's uh, frequently called the psychometric theory, sort of a version of Carroll's um, hierarchical model. So they, they're gonna see uh, three different perspectives at once. You'll also see three different versions of learning. This is a table of contents from a popular educational psychology textbook. So again, here you see learning as behaviorists envision it, learning and cognitive processes, and then knowledge construction, uh, sort of uh, learning from a constructivist point of view. So the consequence for teachers, I think, is that we don't really know what we're doing. We don't really know what intelligence is. There's some psychologists who say intelligence is three things. There's some psychologists who say it's eight things. Then there are some who say it's like God knows what that thing is at the bottom, right? And so we haven't really made up our mind yet. And likewise with learning, there seem to be three different versions of what psychologists think that learning is. We don't really have our act together. Uh, and in one sense, you could say that's true, and it's more true about some phenomena than others, but it's like, yeah, at the theoretical level, we don't all agree on a model. There's much more agreement about the empirical generalizations. Right? That's what these theories are trying to account for, uh, and on that, we mostly agree. Those are, those are just descriptions of the phenomena. Right? So I think a consequence for teachers is, well, if you guys don't really have your act together, I'm kind of free. You're not telling me, look, scientists know this. You're saying scientists think it's one of these three. And so that makes me feel like I can sort of pick whichever one feels most right to me. Right. OK, so researchers expect that theories are going to compete. Practitioners, what they really need is one theory that captures important empirical generalizations. Second difference, starting with researchers, researchers expect theories to make novel predictions. So here's Karl Popper, this famous quotation, those among us who are unwilling to expose their ideas to the hazard of refutation do not take part in the scientific game. So researchers feel theories must make novel predictions, but actually what would be ideal for a practitioner is theories that integrate known empirical generalizations and don't make novel predictions, so they're not learning and memorizing something that is later very likely to be disproven. Could you really have a theory like this? I think you could. And I think Bennett Murdoch offered a great example in 1967 with his paper on the modal model. Right? And if you, many of you in the room will, will know this paper. And what he did was he looked at existing models, uh, tripartite models of memory, and said, just take the common features of all of these models, and you find a fair amount of agreement. So the modal model was the, uh, taken from the statistical measure of the mode, the most common features of all these models. Um, and so if you offered this as a theory of memory, you would, uh, and I've actually been present, when people have sort of tried to pitch something as a theory, that looked like all it was doing was integrating what was already known, and people don't have very much esteem for theories like that. 
In other words, you can't say, well, my theory predicts a negatively accelerating learning curve. Hey, look, I collected data and learning, well, everyone's known that for 100 years, that damn near every learning curve is negatively accelerating. So you can't expect kudos for that, right? If that's what your model predicts, that would be boring for researchers. For practitioners, that would be a great model if we could come up with that. I'll give you one other example. James Gross published a couple of years ago a modal model of emotion, sort of in the same flavor, very stripped down version that uh, most emotion researchers would agree with on the characteristic processing in emotion. So um, this, is what, this is my way around this problem of, well, we can't possibly ask future teachers to learn long, long lists of empirical generalizations tie empirical generalizations together with a small number of these uh, boring models. Okay, so researchers expect theories to make novel predictions. What practitioners need actually is extremely conservative theories. Finally, researchers need theories that employ precise constructs. And I think this grows directly out of the need to make novel predictions. If you're really going to generate new predictions, you can't, um, uh, it's very difficult to do that if you have sort of hand wavy uh, terms that are just sort of verbal descriptions. You really need some precision. And again, this is where you get into constructs that are kind of difficult to wrap your mind around. What practitioners need uh, they don't need novel predictions, they need comprehensibility. Uh, and so what I suggest also ought to go into modal models is the use of folk terminology whenever that's possible. So this is actually um, a, a version of the, um, uh, of the modal model that I presented in a book I wrote several years ago. And I was happy to just call working memory the site of awareness and thinking, right? As long as you're not misleading people and doing violence to the constructs, I think you want comprehensibility first. So researchers need theories that employ precise constructs. Practitioners need theories that employ folk constructs where possible. So this is, again, we're, we're sort of at the end here, but I want to do a, a brief uh, coda, an add-on. Uh, and I want to talk about changes in practitioner education. So what I've spent the whole to talk um, uh, elaborating on is this idea, is that what, what we want to do is focus on empirical observations tied together with these, with these boring theories. But there are two other aspects of this that I haven't touched on at all that are absolutely essential, and I want to make clear uh, why those are important. This is already being done, but I want to, and this is understood to be something that is um, necessary if basic science is to be helpful. Uh, we need to think about, we need to think about uh, ways that we can make clear to future practitioners how this is all going to play out in the classroom. So it's not enough to just learn the modal model. You need to say, here's what it looks like when working memory gets overloaded. Right. Uh, and this actually was the subject of a committee that um, put together by the APA in the mid-1990s where it was felt that there was a problem in the education of future teachers, and this was the focus of it, was that there, there was not enough emphasis on um, letting teachers know how this was actually, these principles were, would actually look to them in classrooms. Uh, the APA got another committee together in 2011 to evaluate and sort of say, okay, so we had this report in 1995, have things improved? And in 2011, the committee uh, reported, we actually do think things have really improved. So they spent a lot of time looking at uh, curricula and coursework material for future teachers, and they said they're more sort of DVDs showing, um, showing classroom situations. There are more examples in textbooks of what things are supposed to look like. So I think there's, there's already a consciousness that, um, that this is important, but I, I didn't want to uh, neglect to mention it. This, I think, is not probably not being done. And again, we have terrible data on this. What I mean by follow through is, I think the common pattern is, you take your educational psychology course usually your first semester of uh, graduate school and education. And the, uh, then that's usually kind of it. All right, so what I've been talking about so far has all been like what ought to go into that course. But we all know if you take a course as a one-off and it's fairly novel to you and that content is never revisited, you will forget that content. 
So again, I don't really have data to back this up, but my hunch is what's happening is people take the one semester course, they pass the course, they don't think about it again. It's not referenced in most of their courses, the, re the remaining of their coursework. They've got their licensing exam coming up, they get a study guide, they refresh their memory on some of this stuff, pass the licensing exam, and then they forget about it. That's my guess about the modal experience for most teachers. If this is actually gonna work and psychological science is actually gonna make a difference, this content needs to be revisited in future courses. That's a really heavy lift. Oh, and by the way, I mean, this is probably self-evident, but one of the reasons is not just a continued practice, but also something like overloaded working memory looks different if you're a high school social studies teacher or you are an elementary math teacher, right? It's gonna, all these principles are gonna play out differently depending on the kids that you're teaching, right? So there, there's consistency, right? That's the whole point of the empirical observations that have to be really consistent across context, but that doesn't mean it always looks exactly the same in every classroom situation. Um, so this, I think, is actually a pretty heavy lift uh, because many of you are academics, when was the last time someone came to you and said, okay, in the interests of curriculum, we need to talk about what you're covering in your course? I don't know about you all, but I'm pretty used to being the royalty in my classroom. And what cognitive psychology is pretty much whatever the hell I say cognitive psychology is. And the idea of someone coming in and telling me, now, okay, this is what's happening in their first course, so you need to make sure you review these, right? That's a, that's a non-trivial ask. Uh, for most academics, uh, and is, is probably, it, it would be hard enough to do number one, but I think that's surmountable, but the, uh, you know, which, again, which is what I've been spent, spending most of my time talking about, but I think th uh, that third point would be, would be really challenging. Okay, I'm going to uh, leave it there. I've got contact information here. I'm always happy to continue this conversation on email or social media. Again, thank you all very much for taking some time with me. And we seem to have lots of time for questions if people have, or comments. Take it away. <laughs> this is great. Um, this is a wonderful talk. It's not what I thought Thanks. you were going to say. I'm sorry? It's not what I thought you were going to say. Okay. Oh, even um, better. It, no, it was, it was really interesting and I loved it. Um, I had expected you to say something about the mental models of students. So for example, when you talk about how a thermostat works, there are two well-known competing mental models of how that works. Yeah. Or students have different mental models about how multiplication works, yes. and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I hoped you were going to say, here's what we have to put into a mental model to represent what a student knows about something, multiplication, thermostats, whatever, and here's how we then tinker with it to help them have a better mental model. Yeah. Any thoughts about that? That would How would be, you build such a mental model? That, that would be a great talk to give. You're, you're, you're right, I didn't give that talk. Um, and it would, you know, that, there, is a, there is an enormous literature on that, especially focused on uh, topics for which kids come in with strong prior beliefs, many of them in, in, in science, because kids do have strong, naive beliefs about the way the world works. Uh, very challenging problem. Uh, yeah, and, and just quite different here. I mean, I'm interested in in this work in the mental models that teachers have rather than that, uh, the mental models that kids have. Okay. Yeah, so I'm happy to continue that conversation with you, but uh, that, yeah. you know, uh, briefly, it's like, have I solved that problem? No. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, so I really liked your distinction about what researchers think of when they think of theories versus what practitioners are thinking of. Um, and I think it's, it's a really nice way to, to you know, figure out how do we best disseminate what we know to a practitioner audience. I'm wondering if researchers are the best people to be doing that, or if you have thoughts on if there are other um, you know, kinds of intermediaries can, who can help translate the basic science to practitioners in a way that's more accessible. Um, and then also what activities and, and other kinds of um, work we need to do as a field to try to figure out kind of what's the threshold for um, a theory that's kind of ready to go for practitioners or what's the level of evidence that we need to be able to say with confidence that this is something that we should be ready to share with practitioners. Right. Um, 
So let me take the, the second question first, which is, uh, let me rephrase it, and you tell me if this is okay with you. It's, you're basically asking, how do we know what is an empirical generalization that would be worth teaching to teachers? Uh, the answer there, to me, the unit of analysis probably ought to be the program level. So if all the faculty who are responsible for teacher training in you know, special ed in early elementary or something can get together and agree, okay, this is, this is, we're all agreed on sort of what children's learning looks like. I think that's the right unit of analysis because there needs to be consistency in what all, everybody in that, all the students in that program are hearing, uh, but I don't see any strong need for there to be consistency, certainly across universities, but, or even within a school. And I, I have every expectation that different schools would sort of have different flavors, and you would get pockets of really strong behaviorism and pockets that would be really strong in the situated uh, perspective and so forth. Uh, and then, sorry, the, your first question was? Yeah, it's more, it's more about, you know, given that researchers and practitioners have very different goals and therefore, you know, the theories that yeah. we're going to be building are going to reflect that. Um, you know, who, who are the right people to be disseminating out these, um, that's, that's these a, theories? Yeah. Is, it, is it really the researchers or is it some sort of intermediary? How are you thinking about that? And I guess if it is the researchers, then the, the second part of that would be how do you incentivize researchers to, to do that kind of work given that it's not typically the kind of thing that you do at an academic I think it, institution? I think it needs to be um, people who know the research literature very widely and fairly deeply, and they also really need to know classrooms. Mm -hmm. If you're a pure researcher and you haven't spent significant time in classrooms, um, you don't know really what's going to be useful to a teacher, and you're, you're not going to know how these, uh, these principles play out in classrooms. So I think you really need knowledge of both. Mm -hmm. So this is why I didn't say like you need to be a researcher or you, know, or you need to be a teacher. I think you just need to have knowledge of both places exactly because it is in between. And I also think that, um, you know, again, all of, all of the educational psychology textbooks that I've looked at are wonderful introductions to the field, but they're very much written from the perspective uh, of a researcher. And I think the people who write them are researchers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that probably wraps it up, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the conference, y'all.